The Washington State flag, Old Crimson, recently appeared on College Game Day for the 292nd consecutive week. It was the perfect symbol for a smaller program's passionate fan base, ironically shown on ESPN, who played a major role in the destruction of Washington State's time in a premier FBS conference. Even so, the executives at ESPN won't be the only wrongdoers in this story. A tragedy filled with betrayal and the demolition of tradition, all in the name of money. Today, we're telling the story of how the Conference of Champions, in the end, became the loser in the musical chairs of conference realignment. You are looking live at a sold out Stanford Stadium, the setting for the Pac-12 game of the year. Unbeaten Stanford against once beaten Oregon. A conference championship and a BCS bid are on the line. You could look at the 2011 season and say that was the last hurrah for the Pac-12. It all culminated in a November matchup between third-ranked Stanford, who was undefeated, and sixth-ranked Oregon coming off a national championship appearance. Oregon was special because it was like playing for Nike University. It was the flashiest brand in the sport. Chip Kelly produced speed and offensive efficiency with his dynamic no-huddle spread offense. For several years, College Game Day visited Eugene more than anywhere else. People across the country who had never stepped into the state of Oregon were becoming Oregon fans. The O and the Duck were becoming like the U and the Buckeye. Stanford, even with its nerd reputation, had become a cool school with the direction of Jim Harbaugh, who had recently left for the 49ers. Andrew Luck was still there and was considered the best quarterback prospect in decades. Elsewhere in the conference, USC was ranked and perfectly capable of delivering national attention under Lane Kiffin and Matt Barkley. Of course, historically, the Trojans were the most successful school in the conference and were the best team in the country in the mid-2000s. Additionally, Steve Sarkeesian had already begun to turn things around for Washington. All in all, the Pac-12 was not just a Power 5 conference, but a force to be reckoned with. At the time, so many things were going right that it was difficult to see all the things going wrong that would cripple the future of the conference. And the primary culprit would be the man put in charge of running the show. In 2009, Pac-10 Commissioner Tom Hansen retired. It was up to the 10 presidents of the schools to pick a new person to lead the charge. And their pick was Larry Scott, the CEO of the Women's Tennis Association. Scott was credited with a 250% increase in revenue for the association during his time there. But it's fair to point out that his first year as CEO perfectly coincided with 16-year-old sensation Maria Sharapova's first WTA title, as well as the continued dominance from the Williams sisters. So who was truly more responsible for the growth in women's tennis. No matter what, the presidents bought into Scott's plan. The strategy was to land a big TV contract for its top-tier football games, which they did with ESPN and Fox. Then the foundation for almost everything else would be the Pac-10, soon-to-be Pac-12 network. This would be somewhat similar to the Big Ten network, jointly owned by the Big Ten and Fox, but the Pac-12 didn't necessarily want to split the money with a major media company. Instead, they wanted to keep it all for themselves because they believed they could distribute their channels like a major media company. The Pac-12 network asked cable carriers for 80 cents per subscriber. That's more than CNN, USA, or FX. Although the network got deals done with some major companies like Comcast, it still lacks direct TV. No direct TV meant no sports bars, a perfect way to alienate both hardcore fans and casual viewers. More importantly, almost 20 million satellite subscribers across the country were missing out. After several years, the network was reaching only 11 million paying subscribers. Meanwhile, the Big Ten with Fox boasted 57 million, and the SEC, who would partner with ESPN, was projected to get 67 million at the time. It was truly easier to watch Northwestern or Rutgers in the Bay Area 
than it was to watch Cal or Stanford. Despite such a glaring issue, the presidents headlined by Arizona State's Michael Crow still were in full support of Larry Scott. The two other conferences had negotiating power because the deals became an all or nothing deal. If a cable company wanted ESPN, then they also had to buy the SEC network. The Pac-12 network didn't have any package deal and lost leverage because of it. This also started the stranglehold that Fox and ESPN would eventually have on the sport. The Pac-12 network headquarters would be built in downtown San Francisco with a state-of-the-art studio, production bays, meeting rooms, offices, and more. Over 11 years, the conference paid over $92 million in rent for its headquarters orders once again in downtown San Francisco. Outside of the TV sector, in 2011, the Pac-12 had the opportunity to add Oklahoma, Texas, Oklahoma State, and Texas Tech. Everything looked lined up to form a super conference. The deal was 30 minutes from being done, but the one hang-up was the Longhorn Network. The Pac-12 wanted every school to be equal in TV revenue, but Texas wanted special privileges with its TV network. Ultimately, the conference lost out not only on Texas, but also the other three. Larry Scott came out and said the four schools didn't stand up to the Pac-12's expectations. An arrogant statement that is aged like milk. He recommended that the conference pass on such an opportunity. There was plenty of agreement around the conference on the decision. Former Washington State Athletic Director Bill Moose said, I like the way the conference is now and I'm pleased the decision was made to keep it at 12 members. I don't see any of our schools wanting to leave. We've established the Pac-12 as a destination. In January 2013, Chip Kelly left for the Eagles and suddenly Oregon was no longer college football's flashiest brand. That same year, USC fired Lane Kiffin in an airport. At the time, Stanford was still successful, but David Shaw couldn't quite recruit or run an offense like Harbaugh. Plenty of top West Coast recruits were willing to bypass the big boys in the West and instead look toward the Southeast. In 2015, the Pac-12 finally had a deal with DirecTV, but the presidents rejected it due to AT&T asking for a clause to make their phone service the preferred provider on all 12 campuses. In 2017, Pac-12 staff were alerted that an urgent meeting was about to take place, and it was Larry Scott who called for the meeting. Immediately, the thought was, we must have a direct TV deal in place. This was the moment years in the making to turn the conference around. But really, Scott called the meeting to announce his new contract, a gross look for Scott, in an embarrassing move by the presidents for keeping him in power when things were already going downhill. 2018 was a disastrous year for the Pac-12. The conference started the year fresh off a 1-8 record in bowl games and then went winless in March Madness. There was also an instant replay scandal. The Pac-12 network still filled less than 20 million homes in the US, and most embarrassingly, the conference was caught attempting to pay the LA Times for positive news coverage. On the field, USC, as the conference's historically biggest brand, limped to a 4-5 and five finish. Oregon barely finished above 500. UCLA hired Chip Kelly to bring his magic back to the Pac-12, but they fell to 3-9. and nine. The Pac-12 called itself the Conference of Champions due to its success in numerous sports, including several Olympic sports, but by and large, financially, only two sports mattered, basketball and mainly football. Over the past decade, Pac-12 cannibalism ran rampant. The number one reason for the conference missing out on the college football playoff was the teams within the conference consistently upsetting each other. In 2020, Scott announced that he would be taking a pay reduction, although what he failed to mention was that he took a $2.2 million bonus. That year, he made $5.3 million in total. That's more than the SEC and Big Ten paid their commissioners combined. To make matters worse, about half of the Pac-12 staff were laid off or had their work suspended. When 2021 came, the presidents finally gave in to what the fans had been begging for for years, out with old Larry Scott and in with the new. Unfortunately, this would be the worst time to take over the conference, 
in its 100 plus year history. Before we get to that though, remember all that went into the Pac-12 network headquarters? Well, funny enough, the lease agreement was soon coming to an end, but it said that the office space must be returned to its original condition. That's estimated to cost another 10 million. A final kiss goodbye from good old Larry Scott. Wait, actually, later we'd find out about one more kiss goodbye from Larry. The Pac-12 owed Comcast 50 million from overpayments. And to make matters worse, the conference performed an audit in 2016, realized the overpayments, and decided to keep quiet. Immediately, speculation hit that Scott kept the secret to make himself look better and continue getting his bonuses. Anyway, 2021. The Pac-12 presidents had a crucial decision on their hands. Who would be the right person to right the wrongs of Larry Scott? And so we're delighted today to introduce to you the new Pac-12 commissioner, George Klyavkov, a highly experienced and pioneering sports entertainment, and digital media executive. George Klyavkov, the president of entertainment and sports at MGM, who lacked experience in college athletics, was the pick to get a strong TV deal done. Then Oregon president Michael H. Schill said, while Klyavkov has deep sports experience, his biggest asset is his ability to listen, connect with diverse groups, find common ground, collaborate, and navigate an evolving landscape. And right on cue, just 20 days into Klyavkov's new gig, the college football world would change forever. All right, we are back, and in a move that could shake up the college football world, Big 12 powerhouses, Texas and Oklahoma, have reportedly reached out to join the SEC. ESPN started a fire. The network secretly approached Texas, Oklahoma, and the SEC for a conference realignment shakeup that destroyed college football as we know it. They didn't care if it meant burning millions of fans and their current partner in the Big 12. The betrayal was so blatant that the Big 12 sent the network a cease and desist letter and accused them of destabilizing their conference. They even had evidence that ESPN tried to encourage another conference to steal other Big 12 members in an effort to destroy the conference so Texas and Oklahoma could avoid their exit fees. That conference is suspected to be the Pac-12. The Big 12 was on life support, and the West Coast had the chance to grab what they needed to ensure survival. Klyavkov was receiving calls from desperate Big 12 schools, so he put together an expansion committee with the idea of poaching the top of the Big 12. 15 minutes into the first expansion meeting, USC President Carol Folt shut it down. So in the end, Klyavkov and the Pac-12 presidents opted out on adding schools, repeating the same mistake they made in 2011. Once again, the arrogance that they were too good for schools like Oklahoma State backfired. And in hindsight, it seems USC had sabotaged the conference. The Big 12 did its best to recover, adding Central Florida, BYU, Houston, and Cincinnati. Meanwhile, the other three Power 5 conferences were hitting the panic button. The Pac-12, Big 10, and ACC announced an alliance like they were playing Survivor and were worried that the SEC was going to vote them out. Those three conferences were growing fearful that ESPN was gaining too much power over college football. Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren said that the three conferences needed to work together due to the turbulence in college athletics. Klyavkov said there was an agreement among three gentlemen, meaning the three commissioners, and a commitment from 41 presidents and chancellors. There is no signed document, and there doesn't need to be. The ACC was already locked into a TV deal until 2036. But for the Big Ten and Pac-12, they had deals on the horizon. Now was the time to make or break. And with the Big Ten having Fox's backing, they were in the power seat. Breaking news in college football. A source has confirmed to ESPN a report in the San Jose Mercury News that USC and UCLA are considering leaving the Pac-12 for the Big Ten. At this point, college football was headed for two major conferences, the Fox Conference and the ESPN Conference. Fox pulled the same rabbit out of its hat as ESPN. Just like that, the alliance was shattered and college football was ruined by the two TV powers. A similar maneuver, fueled by greed, had been attempted in Europe just months before the Texas-Oklahoma move. 
The owners of the biggest clubs in the world attempted to form a super league, destroying any geographical meaning and sense of tradition. But the fans of both small and big clubs protested the corrupt billionaires, uh, attempting to ruin their decades of culture. Eventually, the billionaires pulled out one by one with their tails tucked between their legs. The fans had won and properly shamed the greed. Unfortunately, college football fans just didn't have the same desire to save their tradition. Now the Pac-12 was destabilized, losing the LA market and two of its biggest brands. It would be impossible to ever get that money back in their next TV deal. Sure, they still had some big markets and brands, but the biggest bidders, ESPN and Fox, would rather poach and take what they want. Meanwhile, other players like Apple, looking to boost their streaming library, were instantly looking at a conference with less glamour. Now more than ever, the Pac-12 needed its leadership to step in and save the conference from its doomsday. So where was Klyovkov when this USC-UCLA story broke? Well, he was on vacation in Montana. At this point, the rest of the Pac-12 was forced to be ready to jump ship at a moment's notice. There would be some dancing around with rumors of adding San Diego State, SMU, and others. Truly though, everyone wanted in the Big Ten. That would deliver the biggest paycheck and ensure the survival of your program in a power conference. For some, it was unrealistic and they'd have to take a look at the Big 12, but for others, a certain amount of bargaining could maybe save them from relegation. On July 21st, 2023, the Pac-12 hosted its media day and Klyovkov came out and said, it's not a concern that the Big 12 would poach any Pac-12 schools. Our schools are committed to each other and the Pac-12. We'll get our media rights deal done. We'll announce the deal. I think the realignment going on in college athletics will come to an end for this cycle. Six days later, Colorado announced it would be leaving for the Big 12. Eight days after that, Washington and Oregon bolted for the Big 10. That same day, Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah left for the Big 12. This time, ESPN's villainous behavior would hit a whole new level. It turns out the network helped facilitate the Pac-12 plundering to the Big 12 in exchange for the Big 12 letting Texas and Oklahoma off easy on the revenue they were supposed to forfeit for leaving the conference. Sadly, it gets worse. ESPN even put together transition payments for Texas and Oklahoma to head to the SEC. So basically, ESPN dismantled one conference, then used that conference's desperation to sabotage another conference. Also, Texas and Oklahoma could get off nearly scot-free. And mainly so ESPN gets better value in their TV deals, all while screwing over millions of fans. At this point, the Pac-12 was down to four schools. And with less than a month having passed from the previous exodus, Stanford and Cal decided to join the ACC. A maneuver that made no sense outside of the money involved in football. Over the course of a few years, or even a single month, a century of regional rivalries were wiped off the map. In the long run, the Big 12 survived and the Pac-12 more or less died. They opted to play defense instead of offense for the last decade and it cost them everything. The biggest differential there is smart leadership. Although Klyovkov was put in a terrible situation, he also did a bit of a speed run on Larry Scott's past mistakes. He was originally hired to bring opposing sides together and get a new TV deal, but he failed dramatically on both fronts. So what's next for Washington State and Oregon State, our final two members of the Pac-12? Maybe the most logical move is a reverse merger with the Mountain West, as in the Mountain West schools join up and carry on the Pac-12 name. That's important for branding, but also for the assets that the conference carries as well. There's tens of millions in NCAA basketball tournament and bowl game payouts owed to the Pac-12. There's the conference emergency fund, sponsorship deals, and the Pac-12 network infrastructure. Meanwhile, the 10 schools leaving wish to fully dissolve the conference and split the assets equally. So now there's a war for riches between the 10 departing parties and the two schools staying. In the conference bylaws, it says any notice of withdrawal means a school loses all voting rights. So Washington State and Oregon State 
should make up the entire board. Despite that, Klyavkov has decided to side with the 10 school side. So yes, the Pac-12 commissioner is siding with Big 12, Big 10, and ACC schools over the final schools in the Pac-12. That just about caps off Klyavkov's speed run in Larry Scott levels of unlikability. Sadly, the Mountain West brings in about 4 million annually per school in media rights, which is a far cry from the 30 to 60 plus million that the other power conferences make. So Washington State and Oregon State will do everything they can to at least keep those Pac-12 assets. Now at the end of the day, who's at fault for the death of West Coast college football history and tradition? Well, you can start at the top with the Pac-12 presidents hiring and keeping two commissioners who just couldn't come close to getting the job done. You can criticize those commissioners for frequently failing to have the right feel for the future. You could bring up USC failing on the field, then effectively shooting a hole in the lifeboat in the conference's final hour. You can point to Fox and ESPN for getting into bed with two conferences and ripping away part of what makes the sport so great with the goal of green greener than green spreadsheets. Ultimately, because of the ineptitude and the greed, the fans lose out, especially those diehards waving old crimson on game day every week. And it's only a matter of time before ESPN and Fox shave off the bottom of the SEC and Big Ten. Sorry Vanderbilt, this was only the beginning. It's safe to say without the Pac-12 as we know it, and with the inevitable super conference era, college football will never come close to being as good as it once was.